Welcome to Military Collectors this week, folks. We are in Louisville, Kentucky at the Military Vehicle Preservation Association's National Convention. I've got a lot of great guests this week, a lot on tap. Military Collectors is going to go through this museum and this display like you've never seen before, right here on Military Collectors. Roger that. Well, folks, joining me now is the new president of the MVPA, the Military Vehicle Preservation Association, is Tom Clark from Canada, a 30-year member and now the new president of this great organization here. Tom, I, I've got to thank you very much for being on the show today. And, you know, I really want to emphasize your emphasis about what you, as the new president, want to do coming in to take over this great organization. So uh, t tell us all out there, what, what is your focus? Well, the primary focus, I'm, I'm really excited about the role and the responsibilities of being president and also being a Canadian representing an international group such as the MVPA. I've uh, been involved with the hobby for 30 years and one of, I think, our greatest challenges is growing the hobby and adding new members and reaching down to our next generation, the younger generation, getting them interested in the hobby as well. So that's, that's our primary focus right now is, is membership growth and developing the hobby, being more inclusive versus exclusive. Want to include groups such as model builders who can afford a model, maybe not some of the bigger models that you see here, but some of the smaller models, but also uh, reenactors and other uh, interest groups and veterans groups. Anybody who wants to be involved with us, we're just opening the door for them now. Well, I have to ask you, you know, and, and, and we too want to help grow this organization and, and make folks understand what it is all these members do, not only for the hobby, but for just history and military in general. But you know, one of the things I have to ask you, uh, what is your collection like? My collection, well, my collection could be a lot better, but I'll have to get approval from my, my superior officer and my wife. So she's, she's put up with me for 40 years, so I got to keep that, keep that happy as well. Right now, I've, uh, well, I used to own an M38A1, which was a Jeep, uh, and it was a 67 pattern Canadian Army. I now own a uh, World War II uh, Canadian Army contract Willys MB and uh, totally restored and I've got a uh, M38 Canadian that I'm currently in the process of restoring. Hopefully it will be finished uh, within the next five to six months so I'm pretty excited about that as well. Well one thing is the new president here I know that you're coming in and that, of course the convoys across America and all of that is just a big deal for the MVPA and I know 2019 is is one of those exceptional years coming across going to start in DC, Gettysburg and all of that and so we hope to join you all there as well but tell us about the convoy process because that really gets the message out across the, the country over over a month and a half of the guys on the road. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely incredible. The convoy in itself is 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 a way to showcase the hobby and it, it's history in motion and that's uh, our our magazine we're we're changing our name up from uh, our Army Motors to History in Motion, which more uh, accurately reflects the hobby as a whole, uh, c covering off all the different services, whether it's Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, uh, any of the branches and any of the, our partner, allied partners. So uh, as you can see throughout the entire complex here, you have a good representation of those vehicles. The convoy itself, though, really builds that public uh, interaction and, uh, and and we get great attention and we get great support and one thing you'll find that we we see as Canadians when we come down here is the support of the military, the veterans, and the current serving members which we as an organization really support. So the convoy just fits hand in glove with that. When Military Collectors continues, we meet a special collector and restorer of World War I vehicles who has a special skill despite his handicap. If you have missed any past episodes of Military Collectors, be sure to go online at militarycollectorstv.com and you can see not only past episodes, but also read in-depth features on the people and their passion of their military collections. I'm a little bit country. Oh, and I'm a little bit rock and roll. I'm a little bit of Memphis and Nashville. With a little bit of Motown in my soul. I don't know if it's good or bad. But I know I love it, so. With a little bit of country. And a little bit of rock and roll. The all new Chevy Silverado. It's a little bit country. And it's a little bit rock and roll.
Wonkawatchee Marina, located on the Wonkawa River in Merle's Inlet, is a first-class freshwater marina. For over 60 years, locals and visitors have enjoyed Wonkawatchee Marina as a recreational stopover or as a launching spot on the river. Wonkawatchee offers affordable rates on wet slips, rack storage, fuel services, and a collection of amenities to enhance your boating experience. For a great meal with a waterfront setting, visit Deck 383, located on dock level at the marina. Wakawachi Marina, Merle's Inlet, South Carolina. For 50 years, Ranger Boats has been paying tribute to America's armed forces and their families, not only in the United States, but those men and women who serve all over the world. At Ranger Boats, we appreciate the dedication that these men and women do each and every day, protecting and preserving the very foundations of our freedom. Ranger Boats wants to give back to America's real heroes with our Operation Troop Salute program. For more information, visit rangerboats.com today. Roger that. Well, as we continue this week's show, World War I has been a focus here at the convention in Louisville, Kentucky, but I have a special guest for you all today, and i tell you what, he's got a 1915 World War I Ford anti-aircraft gun, and it's Bob Bro from Atlanta, Georgia. He traveled all the way up here, but I'm not going to tell you a special secret about Bob because I want him to tell you. And so, Bob, I want to thank you very much for being on Military Collectors today, but tell me about about this great piece of restoration uh, vehicle that you have back here. This is this is really neat. Well, as you mentioned, it's a 1915 Ford Model T, and it's original to the family. My wife's family is from Leavenworth, Kansas, and this was sitting in a barn along with five other Model T and A's. And they asked me to start getting involved in restoring them. And I said, I don't know anything about Model T's. I don't know anything about the technology. Give me one I can screw up. So they pulled this old doodle bug, which was a farm implement tool out of a converted Model T out of the farm, and they said, here, go at it. All of the metalwork is original, the radiator, the fenders, the tires, wheels, everything you see is original, except the wood, of course, got eaten up by termites sometime in the last 103 years. So we got the plans from Ford Motor Company to build a light, open express wooden body, and we've recreated this as a World War I light patrol vehicle. Well, you know, I think what's so unique about it is is the quality of the restoration, okay? So now I want to, I, I just have to do this because, it's okay. listen, there, I know it's coming. There, there are folks that have two great eyes, 20-20 vision, but folks, I want you to understand, Bob is blind. He is legally blind. And so, Bob, tell the folks out there the rest of the story because I, it's so special. Well, I grew up, you know, child of a, of, of a baby boomer and, um, you know, a lot of stress, a lot of cholesterol issues growing up, being in the corporate world. And in 2005, I had a minor stroke that caused the blood supply to get cut off to the optic nerve in one eye. And went to the doctors and they said, you know, the bad news is it never happens to guys, it never happens to guys under 60, and it never happens in both eyes. Well, a year later, I won the lottery and I lost my second eye. So my optical prescription is 20 over hand motion. Doctor says, how many fingers? I don't know. Can you see my hand? No. And she does this and I see the, the movement, I see the motion. So obviously I was unable to continue to do my job in real estate. I couldn't drive, I can't read, I can't write because of my optical uh, situation. So I'm now retired, forcibly retired, on medical disability. And my wife says, what are you going to do with your time? And I said, I've always wanted to restore a car. I've always wanted to do a car, which opens up that can of worms. A muscle car, a 50s a T-Bird, a Model A, a Model T, what do you want to do? Well, I always grew up just fascinated with the history of World War II. I built every model kit there was to build. My father served in World War II. Jane's father served in World War II. I said, I'd like to do a military vehicle. We went up to a farmer's field in Cleveland, Georgia that I saw on the internet, and he had a 1942 Ford GPW sitting in the field, engine held in with a ratchet strap, transmission held in with a ratchet strap, wrong seats, wrong windshield. And I felt it with my hands, and I felt the rear panel, 
and I felt the word F-O-R-D. And I said, this one's going home with us. I'm born and raised from Dearborn, Michigan, which is corporate headquarters for Ford Motor Company. And that Jeep went home with us, and I restored it. All by feel, all by touch, every leaf spring, every F-marked nut and bolt, uh, we took it apart. A lot of technologies available out there on the internet to help me read. I could uh, put a picture on a closed circuit television and it would blow it up with enough magnification that I could kind of make out which part went where. Uh, my family was a big help. It became a, a, a team effort. Um, you know, I lost my eyesight, but I didn't lose my vision. And I kept my eye on the prize and I wanted to get that Jeep done. Uh, and the results of that project were in 2013, my 22-year-old son drove my 92-year-old World War II veteran father in a Veterans Day parade in Marietta, Georgia. And that's, that, that's, that's a vision I'll always have. I'll always have that picture in, in my mind. So then it came time to do another military vehicle. When it came time to do the Model T, I said, well, I want a Ford from every World War. So we did it as a World War I light patrol vehicle, did that research, did our homework, realized how we wanted to do it. We had the green paint in stock, so the rest is literally history. Well, I have one last question for you, Bob. How long did it take you to do the Model T? So both vehicles took us about the same time, just a little over a year of being retired. So obviously it's not a weekend project or it's not a late night project, although there was a lot of weekends and late nights involved in, in both of them. So about a, about a year to take it off again, every nut, every bolt, every leaf of the leaf spring, get it down to bare metal, restore the metal, prime it, paint it, put it all back together. Um, the technology between the two vehicles is very similar. They're both six volt. They're both negative ground. They both start with a crank if you need them to. And um, it, it took us about a year. It, it's a labor of love, as those in the hobby know. You don't do it for the money. You'll never get the money out of it you put into it. Uh, you do it because you think it's important. You do it because they've got a story to tell, and you want to help them tell that story. Well, Bob, God bless you. For the, from all of the folks at the MVPA convention here and all those folks across the country who have a passion just like you do, but your passion is special. And so I want to thank you for bringing this all the way up from Atlanta to Louisville, Kentucky, because again, I know it's a labor of love, but it's great to share these things because it has a story. It's your story, and that's so special. Thank you. Stay tuned. After commercial break, we'll take a look at an unusual and rare collection of horse-drawn wagons from World War I. The old 96th District in South Carolina is nestled in the western corner of the state and is a haven for fishing enthusiasts. South Carolina's freshwater coastline wraps around 84,000 acres of water, including Lakes Greenwood, Russell, and Thurman. Experience incredible outdoor adventure, arts, culture, history, and heritage of Abbeville, Edgefield, Greenwood, Lawrence, and McCormick counties. Plan your next outdoor outing in South Carolina's Old 96 District, a part of South Carolina's freshwater coast. If you are interested in preserving and collecting military vehicles, whether you're a military veteran or just have a love for military vehicles in general, then you may be interested in joining the Military Vehicle Preservation Association. The MVPA is dedicated to providing an international organization for military vehicle enthusiasts. For more information and all the benefits a member receives with joining the Military Vehicle Preservation Association, go online at mvpa.org. Every soldier's training is the same, but their story is their own. From the fields of Gettysburg to the tanks rolling across the sands of Kuwait, the story of the mounted soldier is a story of mobility, speed, and the historic power to shift the mighty tides of war. The National Armor and Cavalry Heritage Foundation is asking for your help in keeping the legacy of the United States Armor and Cavalry and telling the stories for many years to come. Well, joining me now is the king of carts, World War I carts, that is, Leonard Grammel from South Bend, Indiana. And these carts 
ammunition and machine gun carts you very rarely see. Probably less than 200 left in the world, probably. Uh, all destroyed after the war, and this guy from South Bend, Indiana, this is his passion. This is his life, his collection. Leonard, I will tell you, it is an honor and a privilege to have you here in Louisville, Kentucky, but I just have to ask you, how many of these do you have? I have 29 carts right now. And, you know, really, the uniqueness of these, okay, how, how did you start your passion, your love, collect these things? Well, I was a gun dealer for 32 years, and I built water-cooled and air-cooled Browning guns, belt-fed weapons. And the 1917 carts are considered the ultimate accessory for a machine gun, especially the water-cooled belt-fed machine gun. And so this is the accessory that can hardly ever be found. Now, this one particular here is, again, one of those original uh, carts. This is just, one of the three I found in the crate. Yeah, just, just briefly describe it because you know not a lot of collectors, not a lot of folks who love the military would even recognize what this was. Right. T tell me what makes this one so unique as an ammo carrier. Well they had to carry a lot of ammo and the wooden ammo boxes. They didn't have the stamping steel technology to make an ammo can like we have today. So they made them out of wood, quarter sawn white oak, painted OD green for World War I. The ammo cart carried either 14 boxes of ammo at 250 rounds per box of cloth belt loaded 30-06. Or they carried 13 boxes and a water can like you see on the gun cart. Right. The gun cart only carried six or seven ammo cans or ammo boxes. The ammo cart carried 14. What makes this distinctive is that of the three companies that made the carts, International Harvester, Vili Car Company out of Moline, Illinois, and the St. Louis Car Company out of St. Louis, Missouri. Now the St. Louis Car Company made buses, tractors, trolley cars, trams, they worked in steel. They made steel stamped Oh, in plates. For the, for the carrier I ends gotcha. of the ammo carrier. Right. They were the only manufacturer to make them out of steel. International Harvester and Vili Car Company made theirs out of wood. So this is a distinctive cart in the fact that it can be verified as made by the St. Louis Car Company because the tags on the front of the carts are, are not marked by the manufacturer. They just give the nomenclature of the military ordnance company machine gun cart, ammo cart, or spare gun cart. So this is a distinctive cart. And if you notice, all of them were painted Vickers because Vickers was supposed to be the premier gun that the U.S. military was going to use, but because England had been at war since 1914, they had made a contract with Colt for the 1915 Colt Vickers machine gun for the United States military, which would have been in 30-06. That was our standard cartridge. So all these carts originally were marked. St. Louis Car Company used paint. International Harvester and Moline Vicker, or Vili Car Company engraved them in the wood. They engraved it rather than paint it. So that's the main story behind the three standard carts and the spare gun cart was declared obsolete because when we started using the Browning 1917 water cooled, you didn't need spare guns. It would outlast any other water cooled belt fed weapon is considered the finest gun of its day. When Military Collectors comes back from commercial break, we take a look at a World War I tank that a whole community got involved in to restore and preserve American history. Let's go! Let's go! I'm a little bit country. Oh, and I'm a little bit rock and roll. I'm a little bit of Memphis and Nashville. With a little bit of Motown in my soul. I don't know if it's good or bad. But I know I love it, so... With a little bit of country! The all-new Chevy Silverado. It's a little bit country, and it's a little bit rock and roll. Take a moment to think about the food you buy and eat. Is it fresh? I mean really fresh. Or is it shipped from a grower hundreds or even thousands of miles away? Well, 
Here in South Carolina, we celebrate fresh, locally grown food and unforgettable meals with family and friends. So, choose food that's rooted right here. Choose certified SC grown. It's a matter of taste. Wakawachi Marina, located on the Wakama River in Merle's Inlet, is a first-class freshwater marina. For over 60 years, locals and visitors have enjoyed Wakawachi Marina as a recreational stopover or as a launching spot on the river. Wakawachi offers affordable rates on wet slips, rack storage, fuel services, and a collection of amenities to enhance your boating experience. For a great meal with a waterfront setting, visit Deck 383, located on dock level at the marina. Wakawachi Marina, Merle's Inlet, South Carolina. Roger that. Well, here at the 2018 convention in Louisville, Kentucky of the MVPA, our focus today is on World War I. And joining me is Jim Osborne. He's from Vincennes, Indiana, a collector, 73 years old, a former judge, but this guy has got a collection that's out of this world, but he's got this M17 World War I tank behind us. Jim, God bless you, and thank you so much for what you, all you do for preservation of history, but tell me about this wonderful tank. Well, Bob, there's the, the M1917 is extremely rare. They made 950 in World War I. Of that, only 20 still exist, counting this one. So you, you, you can understand how rare they are today. We didn't have one at the Indiana Military Museum, and, uh, and, and at the price that the last one went for, close to a million dollars, uh, we weren't going to have one. <laughs> and so unless we put one together, pieced one together, build it or something. We looked into that. We started finding some original parts, but not a lot. We decided we're just going to build the rest to scale. We're going to get all the dock, all the drawings and all the specs and start doing it. We got the uh, we got the steel donated. We had various other things donated along the way that all made it possible. And we had two very very skilled metal workers uh, that, that jumped in on this job and, and uh, said we'll we'll tackle this. So that was three years ago, and there it sets. So uh, you know it's a long long trail, but we, we we accomplished it. Well, I have to ask you. Let's go back a little bit. Yes. How did you get into collecting and, and preserving things like this? Seven years old, I started collecting. It was shortly after. World World War II, all, they, all the World War II things were around that people were still talking about World War II. I just started hauling things home, helmets, you know, putting them in my parents' basement. Before long, the basement was full and they, they began to notice it was filling up. So that's just how it started. I, I, I've been collecting ever since I was seven years old. It just went from small things to bigger things. It went to Jeeps and went to artillery and then it went to tanks and, and it just kept getting, now we have aircraft as well. And and now we've also formed the Indiana Military Museum, which is a, which is a not-for-profit 501c3, which whereas all these things are housed now in Vincennes. Well, and you're continuing to grow, obviously, the museum there to house all of the vehicles. Yeah. But how important is it to the economy there, and how important is it to history uh, that what you're doing? Because it has a tremendous impact. Glad you mentioned that because it's important both ways. Uh, locally, Vincennes is a very historic city. Tourism is important there, and we're kind of an integral part of that now. And uh, we have uh, maybe 15,000 visitors a year come to the museum, so I, that's real important. And it's real important that we have youngsters and school groups, veterans groups, they all come now to see the museum, see what we have, understand U.S. military history better. It makes us very happy, very proud. Well, Jim, you have another key piece here, very rare. Let's go take a look at this because sure. it really interests me, although it's not American, yeah, but it's significant. It's, a, it's another rare armor piece I'm going to show you. After you. <clears throat> this, is, this is a turret, Maxim machine gun turret, out of a German A7V tank. Now, people think the Germans had a lot of tanks in World War I. Nope, they built 20. That was it. Only 20 tanks. This is, a, this is one of six, there will be six of these gun turrets in each one of those tanks. After the war, all of the Allied powers got one of these tanks as a souvenir, shipped them home. The U.S., the British, the French, the Australians, and so forth. Today, only one of those still exists in Australia, in the, in the Australian War Museum. All the others were scrapped. This came out of the U.S. tank, Nixie, which was his, was his popular name, the Germans gave it. This came out of that tank the day it was being scrapped and was saved. 
So it's, this is an extremely rare piece of, of armor history, uh, this turret right here. So uh, we built, again, our people built the rest of this to replicate exactly what that gun position would look like in the tank. This is the original piece right here that it's that it, that it emphasizes. So we're really proud to have this too. I mean, it's it's a, it's an interesting. Uh, cog in the wheel of all this uh, all this history of armor. Well, you know, Jim, I will tell you, I'm so impressed with what you have done and over the course of, of your years of collecting, that is why we're doing what we do to yep. showcase folks just we, like you across this country. So. We appreciate it. Appreciate being a part of that and, and thank you for your interest in us. I hope you'll uh, hope you'll come to see us. Well, if folks want to come see, they I know you have a website. We okay? do. Tell everybody out there how they can log on so they can come and see Well, it'd be Sims. under indianamilitarymuseum.com.org, uh, .org, I think both. And, and uh, uh, we're open every day, uh, 10 to 4 every day of the, of the year. So uh, they come to Vincennes, uh, just ask for the Indiana Military Museum. It's right downtown. It, it's, it's next to the George Rogers Clark National Park. We're just adjacent to that. Perfect location. Well, that's part one of Military Collectors this week from the MVPA convention here in Louisville, Kentucky. I want to tease a little bit about next week's show. It's a two-part series, and this ambulance right here, this is my personal collection here. I'm back at the motor pool, but the WC-54 1942 Dodge Ambulance, our guest next week was a young soldier with Patton's army across Europe. He landed at the beaches of Normandy in his WC-54, and he took that thing all the way to Berlin. And Tom Grasser is gonna be a special guest on our show, as well as Melvin Richardson, who was a CB during World War II. Those two guys, I tell you, when you hear their stories, if it doesn't bring tears to your eyes, just about like it did ours, I'm telling you, you just really have no idea the sacrifices that these two guys made, as well as every veteran of the greatest generation. So, with all of that, I'd like to thank everybody at the MVPA who made our visit possible to Louisville, Kentucky. We hope you've enjoyed Military Collectors this week. Until next week, we'll be right back here again on another episode of Military Collectors.